Hello, everybody, and welcome to another evening behind the vice with Uncle Feather Merchants. Uh, this evening for our pre uh, break video, we are going to be doing a uh, a fun episode here entitled Junk Flies with none other than the man himself who loves fishing some junk. Uh, brings junk to the little, little boys and girls only on the naughty list. Uh, and we have quite a list of naughty little flies that you would not want to tell your buddy you were fishing. But he's going to want to know what you were fishing because they work. And so we're talking about junk flies this evening. And uh, in this episode, we're going to hit one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different flies. Uh, all with their own little special touch out there on the water. Uh, so thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, if you guys have been watching any of these other series, I hope you have. We've done Beautiful Nymphs, uh, hosted by Mr. Craven. Uh, we did Dry Flies with Mr. Lantigan. And today we are doing Junk. Uh, Trout Unlimited has done a fabulous job of helping us spread the word of these great videos. We hope you're loving them. We hope you love them so much you're already subscribed to YouTube. If you are not subscribed to our channel, please take a second and do that and do us a favor and just ask a buddy to join in on these and tag a buddy who needs to see this. Um, all of this will be archived on YouTube. Um, and, uh, and so you can watch it at your leisure and, uh, and catch up on these really fabulous patterns we're going to tie here. Uh, Let's not forget to mention we are taking a break, right? We've got work to do over uh, the holiday, which means delivering these junk flies to the mouths of hungry trout along our tailwaters here in the Rocky Mountain West. Uh, and plenty of these flies will be found in the Southeast, uh, in the Northern Georgia and Appalachia region uh, of the country as well. And it's a fabulous time to take those on the water. So we will be fully back. January 6th with our next episode hosted by tailwater junkie Matt McCannell and Matt uh, is one of Umqua's signature tires uh, and, and a true tailwater nerd uh, and he will be hosting our tailwater session uh, all about tailwater flies uh, which is going to be really fun that's January 6th so again if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel you will get an automatic alert when we go live uh, with one of these uh, and upcoming events, so please do that. But more importantly, sit back, pour a deep glass of eggnog with your favorite colored liqueur in there, and, uh, and let's get to tying some flies. So the first one tonight uh, is from a near and dear friend, and uh, an Umqua signature tire, in fact, but this is not one of his signature patterns. In fact, none of these are Umqua signature patterns. These are all flies that were Kind of too good to put in the Umpqua catalog, so to speak. But uh, this one's called the Shoelace Worm. So check it out. Okay, here we are. I'm tying what I like to tie most, not. Um, it's very infrequent that I decide to fish junk, but when I do, I like to go big and durable. Um, obviously there's a lot of junk out there these days and very effective ways to fish them. Uh, so what I'm going to be tying up for you is a jerk snake of sorts, um, that I learned from a guide up on the Bow River in Calgary. Uh, and this is going to be a big leather worm. Um, essentially what I'm going to be using is leather shoelace comes in a lot of different colors. Today I'll be tying it in red. And yeah, I typically fish these early spring, right as the water's running off. That water's going to be really cold, so those fish won't necessarily move to the streamer that I want to fish. So this is when I start fishing junk. Um, so yeah, we're going to be tying on a 2312 hook. Really doesn't matter. I just like a longer shank with a natural bend. 2302 is also a great hook. Uh, and I'm going to start with some thread in red. So I'm just going to start with a, a pretty, you know, clean base of thread here, just so it will be able to grab the first material that I'm going to tie with. And that's going to be a red wire. I'm not super concerned with touching turns here. I'm going to be using a UTC medium red. And 
how I'm just going to catch that wire up front. And I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to touching turns as I come back. Doesn't matter if it's perfect, but pretty much so. This is going to be ex essentially exposed on the bottom of the leather worm. Um, so in general with worms, you can go a couple different ways. Uh, probably like you saw with the uh, latex worm, it's weighted. I'm going to go unweighted. If I'm fishing junk, I'm going to go full on junk with a bobber because I'm fishing worms, bobber and worms and split shot. Uh, now it's going to have a lot of free flowing movement. Um, cool part about fishing with this leather is the more it gets wet, the more it wiggles and it's very durable. So anyway, here we are. I've gotten that wire in onto the hook. I'm going to select a piece of leather. This is the leather color I typically use for Palola worms, but Jake has now made me use it for junk pies. So here we go. Uh, nice long tail, you know, length of the body. If you want to get technical, <laughs> you could always make it longer and then cut it down. So just a couple securing wraps, not too concerned with my thread. Oh, it is actually getting pretty flat. Hold on. I'm going to spin my thread up to make it tighter. So since that leather is pretty stiff, I'm going to give about five or six wraps back here just to really create the foundation of where this wire is going to start coming over this leather. Now I'm going to just casually work my thread up front. I'm not going to bring it all the way up to the eye. I'm going to kind of create a little segmentation, kind of that middle piece in the worm. Um, so yeah, I'm going to come back about two or three eye lengths behind the eye and tie down the leather. Okay. I'm going to start pinching that down. All this work that I've just done with the thread right here is going to be covered with a chenille, so not very important if it's touching turns and super clean at this point. So like I, I mentioned, durable, um, you know, using ultra chenille for worms, like a sandlawn worm, awesome. They do fall apart over time. Squirmies, as you know, they don't last very long. That's why I like this style and you get a nice big profile. So now I'm gonna bring this wire over my thread wraps back here. And since I'm using that medium, I can really crank down on this stuff. Just nice even spacing. Okay, I've got to where the chenille is. I could either tie off my wire here or I could bring it in front of the hook uh, or in front of the leather and tie it off, really doesn't matter. Just gonna give that three turns on one side, three on the other. My effort to kind of keep this a streamlined video, I'm not going to glue. That would be a good occasion to start gluing right there just to really keep that wire in place. Um, next, I'm going to be using a ultra chenille, size small, in a shell pink. Up to you, you can use kind of a dull orange mustard tan right here. Um, I like using this pink because now we almost have a bacon and egg stain going on here. It's going to act as that segmentation or it can act like a egg, which there's nothing wrong with an egg. So now I'm just going to cover up my work and create that little segmentation that worms typically have. And I'm going to tie this off. Three wraps and one wrap on one side to catch it. Um, as far as cutting right here for the chenille, totally fine. I'm actually going to try to like kind of sneak it underneath here. Um, just so I can completely cover that thread or that chenille with thread and really lock it into place once I'm finished with the fly. So now I'm going to come under here, just do some thread work to cover up that chenille. And then I'm going to whip finish. Now 
maybe a bit of a over-engineered worm at the end of the day, but what I like about it is it's gonna have a really big profile, a lot of sandworm. Worms are maybe the length of this hook, a little bit longer. Squirmies, yeah, you can make them long, but yeah, nice big profile, nice and bright. It's gonna wiggle once it gets wet. Um, and it's gonna stay in the game for you all day. There you have it. So how many of you guys have fished a worm similar to that? Guilty, raise your hand and proudly admit that those things work. Leather worms are amazing. Uh, one of the things that I love about them is like we saw with Alex worm, uh, if you were on Instagram, you saw it barely was able to contain itself within the, the vertical viewing platform of Instagram. But you can tie those worms jumbo. And it's almost shocking to see how large of a worm a trout will eat. The bigger the stalker, the bigger the worm. It's a, it's a beautiful combination. It's a simple equation. And that leather really, really holds up. And when it gets wet, which you don't see in the, in the screen there, it has so much movement to it that it just boings around in the water and just rolls along that substrate. And those big guys boom, lock right onto it and have a lot of fun with it. Uh, so if you haven't done a leather worm, you absolutely must. Uh, we do have a couple in the Umpqua catalog. They are appropriately scaled, not stalker scaled, right? Uh, so definitely, definitely check some of those out. Um, and, uh, and if you guys have questions, right, uh, we do have Instagram here. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you guys have on junk. How dirty of a fly is it? We could rate them, which I think would be fun, on a scale of one to 10. Like one being not dirty, but elegant. 10 being filthy, and uh, you should be ashamed of yourself for even conceiving such a, a fly. Uh, go ahead and drop those down in there and let us know what you guys think of, uh, of, the, of the dirtiness of these, these kind of junk food flies. Uh, and, and same goes for you YouTube folks. Uh, again, if you want to make sure that these big junk flies don't get cut off on this little vertical platform, head on over to our YouTube page where everything is, is wide, horizontal, and, uh, and you can see it all. So uh, hopefully you guys like that one. Uh, yeah, you could absolutely do a leather, jig, a leather worm on a jig hook. They work great. The problem with doing a leather worm on a jig uh, is if you want to fish one as big as what we just saw on the shoelace, you'd have to call it some kind of scrunchy worm or something. You couldn't call it a shoelace because that shoelace worm is intended to be big. And those little jig hooks, they don't have much of a platform, right, before, uh, you know, you don't have much tie-in points. So you can't kind of have that same platform on a jig. But absolutely, you can do jigs, right? And, you know, they go up to size eight, which is a really big one uh, at that point. Um, the leather boo, fair enough. Well, uh, so we're gonna keep moving along. And, uh, and, and the next fly that we're, we're gonna tie up this evening uh, comes to us from one of our really good friends and signature tires, Devin Olson. And uh, Devin comes out of the competition world. And for anyone who, boy, who has had to fish a tournament uh, or a fished in one, uh, you know, and, and you've traveled, let's say, to like, you know, North Carolina or something, they know all about dirt. Uh, and I've, I've walked a couple of those competitions, and you get back, and you're like, how much you get? And, and, and this guy says, hey, man, I got, I got 41. You're like, you got to be kidding me. And he's like, no, man, you wouldn't believe what I got him on. And it's this next fly. And you can tie this next fly in a rainbow of colors. Again, articles have been written on this fly uh, and the ethics of it, but it's a really good one. You can find it at a gas station. It's a mop. Uh, so let's watch Devin tie up his mop. Thanks for tuning in tonight, everybody. If there's one junk fly that comes out of my box the most often, it's the mop. I've been fishing this pattern since uh, 2014 when my teammate Pat Weiss showed it to me at the uh, during practice for the World Championships in the Czech Republic. It had already been making waves along the East Coast probably at least a year prior. Since I started fishing it during that practice, it's become one of my favorite confidence flies. Uh, it has worked 
sort of the world over and it's i would definitely label and label it an all or nothing pattern it's the kind of fly that you just have to try and you may be really surprised with how well it works or it might catch nothing but it's always worth a shot so we've got a size 12 uh umqua 400 jig hook you could also do a size 10 we have a 3.3 millimeter slotted bead on this but i tie the, this fly with beads all the way from <clears throat> 2.3 millimeters up to you know four millimeters uh, you want to tie it a little bit heavier than you would any other pattern for the same type of water because all the surface area on this fly really tends to slow down its sink rate so plan for more weight than you might be used to with other patterns in the same type of water so we have some a dot uni thread this is just rusty done and we're going to cover the shank with a little bit of thread And then we're going to go ahead and put some super glue on it. And I'm going to back off that thread about one turn behind the bead and just put some super glue on the shank here. Try and hold that. That thread is a little bit exposed to fish's teeth. So if you can hold it together and then also glue the, the mop body to it, it ends up being a little more durable. And then we're just going to take our mop body here and I'm going to measure it. Because this is a size 12 hook, I'm going to make this one a little bit shorter. So I'm, I really only have it about the length of the shank behind the, the hook. I'm going to crank it down with a pinch wrap and then one, two, three wraps back kind of spaced to the, to the bend of the hook, wrap there and then wrap back three as well. It doesn't look as good as if you just were to tie it in at one point. I fully acknowledge that but this fly will hold together a lot better if you've wrapped it down on the shank like that. And um, also by wrapping that tail to the back of the hook right there, I get a lot less fish that uh, take the fly and miss it. Um, if you tie the, the tail really long on this fly, you can have a lot of fish grab and, and not get hooked. Um, I think probably just because their teeth get stuck in a really long tail. So I like Short tails for that. Uh, one more reason I like the short tail, if you tie it in just up here, like you see a lot of people do, like just at one point, then it tends to foul around the hook a lot. And, and this uh, material already fouls around the hook. So if you can tie it all the way into the back of the hook, you'll reduce that fouling and have less trouble. But you can also see because I put that super glue on, I kept this from spinning. It wanted to spin at first, but it doesn't spin now. So you can then just finish the fly off with any sort of dubbing that you want. This is just some natural gray hair's ear or squirrel dub. That works fine. You could put a hot spot dubbing up here, pink, orange, um, you know, whatever you want. But this is nice and simple and uh, one that I turn to the most often. So it should work well for you as well. And then I'm just going to take some super glue and brush it on that thread. And do about three or four turns and then just a three turn whip finish. And just make sure it tightens up in there. Nip it off with the scissors and that's it. That's your finished mop. Really simple. You can crank out dozens of these in an hour and you might want to because uh, it is the type of pattern you're going to slither along the bottom a lot, but um, thankfully it's easy to replace. So go out there, give it a shot, and I know that uh, you're going to be surprised if you haven't tried this fly before. Hey y'all, hope you enjoyed the mop. Uh, I know I certainly did. Uh, fish them personally uh, and deliver them to little little trouts around the country in, in, the, in the tan color, which is maybe a number one. Chartreuse, if they're a wild brown trout, is an absolute number two. The Cheeto uh, is a great one. The Peach Mop, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, if you haven't tried a mop, um, you certainly should. They're very interesting in the way they fish. Uh, and if you feel like that's just a little too far over to one side for you, Umqua does a fly uh, by signature tire John Pond called the Deep Cleaner, which uses, it's a stone fly, which has a, uh, 
a mop rear portion, right? And, and, and really does resemble more of a, of a natural. But that mop material, what it does is it absorbs a lot of water. And so when that gets down in those really slow currents down deeper in the water, right? Uh, it moves very, very slowly into that stuff. And so that mop material just slows your whole drift down. A lot of times I refer to it as like a parachute for your rig. And so it'll just really slow everything down. You know, that, uh, that deep cleaner or a mop. Um, I, I know a lot of guys that fish that in really, really heavy water and those fish that sit underneath those, um, underneath those really heavy currents on those, on those drops, those heads of rungs, right? Where you get that big bucket. You can get down in there and stay in there and find some of those bigger fish that don't pull out to the edges as often uh, as some of the smaller guys do. Um, so yeah, uh, the mop's a really fun one. Uh, if you haven't fished it, again, recommend at some point you put that on your rig uh, so you can at least have an opinion whether you love it or you hate it. Because that's half of fly fishing is to just have opinions on what you like or what you don't like. Um, so I hope you guys have an eggnog and are, are enjoying this presentation here. Why am I in the dark? Well, uh, why, I, I would love to address that. Would you want to be the host that talks about junk flies and junk food for fish? Or, you know, remain slightly anonymous so that you could keep your chin held high amongst your peers uh, out in the community? Um, you know. We all have a little bit of uh, an ego that, uh, that we try to protect, but really not above much here. Uh, not above much. Let's see. Yep, mop hatch usually comes right after the power bait hatch. I don't disagree with that. Um, yeah, before the rooster tail spawn. Yeah, those are the kind of flies we're talking about. It's, it, it's good times here. It's good times. And, and so we're going to get into another fly. And I would say if you thought the mop was a controversial fly, right, uh, I would say this next one has its even more and, and has some of its own allure. And, uh, you know, if you've ever been down to a really, really technical tailwater, like the San Juan River, you know that these fish don't just eat anything, right? It's all about downsizing and how small you can downsize and how thin of a fly that you can tie. So I think you're really going to next like this next little bit of junk food we're going to serve up here this evening. So check it out and stay tuned with us. Hi, I'm Mike with Umqua, and today I'm going to show you how to tie the naked lady fly pattern. This pattern was showed to me over on the San Juan River, where the fish are typically eating a lot of midges and annelids. An important thing to know about this river is there's a lot of pressure as it gets fish year round. So it's important to have your flies nice and sparse. To get this fly started, we're gonna take a U004 hook. You can see the color is red. Next, we are gonna take the fly and crush the barb in the vise. Make sure we've got a nice, easy release for the fish. And you're good to go. Nice thing about this fly is it's a quick little tie. All you have to do is head down to your local fly shop and buy a pack of hooks, and you'll be able to tie a lot of these real quick and fill up your box. That's it. That's it. Red hook, right? They don't have to count the number of thread wraps or segmentation on that one. It is simply red uh, and it simply catches. So next time you're, uh, you're fishing with a guide and he's pegging stuff above that red hook, he'll tell you they're eating that red hook, uh, that red hook annelid or midge that's down there underneath that egg or that piece of bleach material or anything like that. But man, that's one of those hot tips you only learn from a real pro been doing it a while so i'm glad you were here to see that one because again when it comes to tying i mean you know you don't want to spend you know an hour tying up a, a midge pattern to lose it when you could just use a bare hook uh so it, it it has been coined the naked lady uh of new mexico and uh and i would rate that 10 out of 10 for junkie and i hope you guys agree that's uh that's about as dirty as it comes uh for for a fly um, so, uh, so we're going to keep it moving. Um, and if you guys have any questions on this stuff, uh, definitely let us know. We're trying to have some fun here with the naked lady and, and some of these flies that we all have fished from time to time. And 
you know, we all kind of go through different angler progressions, right? You know, there's stuff, uh, there's stuff that you never want to admit that you did back in the day, but you did it and it was dirty. And, uh, you know, you got to go through the motions. So we're, we're helping you along your angling evolution here with tonight's junk food episode. So let's see here. We're going to move on to a worm uh, that came to the States. Man, uh, Hannah, I know you're on here. Uh, what year do you think this came over? Uh, if I had to guess, this to me is like 2008. Um, but it was, uh, it, was, it was when, man, probably earlier than that. Um, it was when we, the U.S. was just starting in the competition world, and uh, they had an angler from Poland. Uh, national champion that uh, that showed uh, that showed the U.S. team this worm fly, and this worm fly is called the Vladi's worm. And at the time, it was it was like when the squirmy came out and the common angler got a hold of it. It was like, dude, we are we are just pounding fish. Uh, 2005. So thank you, thank you, Hannah, for that. I knew it was back there. Um, so uh, it was kind of like the the original version of the squirm and. Uh, and again, when this first got into the boxes of anglers and, and onto the end of the rigs, it just seemed like it was one of those magic junk flies that was just like, put it on, catch big fish. Put it on, catch more big fish. And so uh, the Vladi Worm absolutely has a place in history, and we're going to show it to you now. Signature tire, Randy Hanner, uh, is going to whip this one up. So enjoy. All right, hi everybody. Um, this is Randy Hanner, um, and I'm doing a trash fly. And I was trying to figure out what I what I could tie up. I wanted to do a mop or something else. And um, Jake just helped me decide that we decided we're gonna I'm gonna tie condom worm. So we're gonna do a Vladi condom worm for the uh, for my trash fly here. Um, starting out, I'm using a uh, Timco 5263 hook, size four. And the first thing we're going to do, um, I've already pre-bent this, um, and this is going to help give the, the fly the right look to it. It doesn't look like much now, just a big hook with a big bend in it. But I'm going to add some O2O lead wire, and i um, going to add a couple layers of this. So we'll start right back here at the bend of the hook. And this is going to give the weight to the fly that's obviously going to help it get down quickly. All right, there's one. Do a second layer right over top of it. enough there. I actually learned to tie this fly from Vladi himself. All right, that's going to be enough weight to uh, to help get that fly down. Um, next thing I'm going to do actually is I'm going to put some Zappa Gap or super glue over this. It's going to help lock that in place. But I'm going to take my, my thread, and in this case, my thread is uni stretch, pink. Um, you could use white or you could use white um, three out thread on here or um, you know 210 denier. Next thing we need is a condom. So when you're tying this, um, obviously, you pull it out of the package and it's nice and round. But what I'm going to do is I actually cut it in one spot and then open it up. It makes it a lot easier to work with. The last thing you want to do is completely open and um, unroll everything. That's, you don't want to do that. It makes it nice and easy to handle this way. And then you're going to cut it into a couple of like, uh, you know, quarter inch um, pieces just like this. 
So I've done that already. I've got two lined up. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my 5x tippet here. Oh, that was bad. Unfortunately, this one is lightly lubricated. So gripping that uh, <laughs> is a little difficult. But 5x tippet for the rib. And I know you're probably thinking of quite a few jokes out there right now, and I don't blame you. All right, so we got that in. That's perfect. We're not going to use that for quite a while. Now, the next thing we're going to do is I'm just going to take one of the pieces that I trimmed. I'm just going to open this all the way up. And then you're going to tie it in. And I'm going to tie it in straight on top of the lead. It doesn't have to be that fancy where you get your tie-in spot because it's all going to get covered up anyway. I'm going to cover up this lead and smooth out the transition. Do one line all the way up and then back down. I'm going to leave my thread at the back. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just start. I'm not going, I'm, it takes us just a split second for it to get caught in the back. So if you want, you can twist it up a bit. But you're just going to start wrapping and you don't want it to you want it to twist up. See how right here it's, it's starting to twist and leave a gap? That's exactly what you, you want it to do because when you get up towards the front of the fly, this is going to help segment the, give segments to it. So I'm just letting it do its thing all the way to the top. And then I'm going to turn around and I'm going to go all the way back down. And as you can see, it's really starting to look like a worm. Go all the way back down, right to the bend there. I'm going to catch it with my thread. And lock it in place. Right there, that's perfect. Now what I'm going to do <clears throat> is I'm going to take a piece of flash and I'm going to tie this in. You can do that right at the very beginning as well. Um, but what I'm going to do now, now that that flash is tied in, I'm going just going to try to move my thread up and this is going to kind of give it some ribs on the inside as well. And I'm going to pull this straight over and lock it in behind the eye. And it's okay that this little gap is here right there. That's completely fine. I'm going to cut that off. Now that I still have this last piece here, we're going to use this to go ahead and cover up the entire fly. And this time we want to try to keep it flat and open. And it's okay to pinch it in place just to get it to flatten out again because you don't want the cordage to 
that we had on the first go round. Sometimes that happens too. It is a condom after all. It's perfect. I want to just tie that off right at the eye of the hook. Now we're going to take our tippet material and we're going to try to get it to bind in. And this is where you can really bind down on the rib. And you really start to see the worm shape take Do a half hitch just to lock it in, then I can let all the tension off and it's still going to stay right in place. Go ahead and trim that off. Do more whip finish. And here is a condom worm. Go fish it. So let's rewind our mind. I'm going 10 out of 10 dirt with that one because if we rewind our minds to 2005, there were no squirmy wormies, right? Uh, we, we only had chenille or leather, right? There wasn't any kind of, of this really soft uh, material that, you, that the fish could really put their teeth in and like get that soft response like a live bait. Um, you know, and, and speaking of live bait, I saw some some comments in there. Have you ever tried, uh, you know, flavored condoms for the worm? Guys, we're not trying to fish bait here. We're trying to fish flies. This is this is still a fly fishing classy program. So stay with us on that one, and you know, don't go to the dark side about scenting your flies because that really is the dark side. Uh, but this is just is like this is just above where that line would exist is the Vladi worm. Again, in 2005, this thing was, was totally revolutionary. Um, again, like if, it were, if, if you've ever fished a squirmy wormy, uh, you, know, you know that that fly just gets bit better than any other worm. And it was the same thing for the Vladi worm uh, when this kind of hit the U.S. market uh, and, and came out and, you know, anglers kind of got their hands on it. Uh, I don't know. You know, I don't know how often you guys wrap lead on the shanks of flies anymore, right? Uh, but you could see there was a lot of lead there. You could kind of customize your weight. You know, it's very similar to the way we, we architect flies now uh, with our different beads and bead sizes and bead colors. Um, but yeah, this was, a, this was a really, really cool fly uh, for its day. And it's still a really, really great fly. Um, the uh, the person that 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 said that I thought it was a joke, but I dude, I know I know there who said that. No one's looking for any upper upper hand you can grab at, including maybe a scented condom. You know, strawberry is wonderful flavor. Uh, you know, uh, evergreen, right? If you're into chewing, uh, would be another great one. Uh, but uh, but we're gonna keep rolling. 
Um, I hope you guys like that. I hope I hope you're at least I hope you're at least thinking about other ways to use material, right? So the mop fly that we saw, those were originally, and you guys have seen these in AutoZone, you guys have seen these at Walgreens, you guys have probably seen these at the grocery store. They're dust cleaning devices, right? So someone originally thought of the idea, and I heard rumor that the original mop fly started in Bryson City, North Carolina at the Dollar General. Uh, I don't want to be quoted on that, but that is the rumor that I have heard at the Dollar General. And he said, man, that's cool. I think that would be a great body for a fly. Uh, and we saw the same thing. Um, we saw the same thing with the condom, right? So, like, here's like a, an everyday object that we would never relate to time flies with uh, that became this really kind of like uh, popular way to put, you know, material onto a hook. And and so, hopefully, if nothing else in this junk fly presentation, you as tires are inspired to try stuff that's not in our standard fly shop assortment, right? Um, you know, I know a guy uh, that has a whole drawer of condoms in various colors, uh, and mostly the one color we saw, which is kind of that shrimp pink, um, or human skin, I guess you could refer to that as. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, so these, these, these things work their way into shops, into tires, desks, and, uh, you know, it'll be cool. I'm sure one of you guys or gals will eventually come out with the next big thing. Uh, and we'll all end up having it in a drawer in our time desk somewhere. Uh, because you, as, as the tire, were inspired to try something a little different. So uh, we're going to try something a little different again with our next fly. And uh, I do realize I was on mute, by the way, but only after the fact. So uh, you'll have to forgive me for that. Um, got a couple all text, uh, all caps text that read the word mute. So uh, we're going to transition into our next fly. And uh, if uh, Mr. Craven, previous host, is on here, so cheers to cheers to Charlie. I saw Lance pop in. Um, Charlie, better keep keep it pretty uh, pretty pretty tame on here. Uh, this is this is stuff that you know is in and outside of your realm, my friend. Um, but uh, so this next fly uh, again was shown to me by a uh, by a friend, um, and uh, and for anyone that lives down in the southeast, you've you've heard the name Michael Bradley. Uh, he lives in Cherokee, North Carolina. And in Cherokee, man, they have um, they have some pretty great rivers, and they have some rivers that they they make really great by putting in some just absolute slabs. And uh, and we were doing a, a fishing tournament down there, and he showed me this fly, and I was like, dude, there's no chance I'm gonna fish it. And it, come on, this is crazy. We were fishing low clear water. Three days before the tournament, there was anchor ice. Uh, that was meeting the shelf ice, right? So the river was almost flo frozen all the way through and it was low, clear, cold. And he was like, dude, trust me, you're gonna want some of these peach and pink. And so I tied him up and plugged him into the river, dude. And, uh, and instantly, you know, this is why you listen to people. Um, instantly I was rewarded with some really, really big fish uh, on light tippet uh, in low, clear water when you know, I'll be fishing eggs in a, in a river like Cheeseman Canyon. And I've heard this from Pat Dorsey. You know, you, you put an egg uh, as an attractor on there, and in some of those low, clear, pressured rivers, I mean, fish will instantly lock up, right, and just stop eating uh, when they see that bright fly coming down. That was my fear until I saw what the trout brain could do. So let's roll the trout brain. In the jaws, we've got uh, an XC450 wide gap jig hook. And uh, this is gonna be the foundation for a fly that's called the Trout Brain. Now, the Trout Brain is a fly that I was introduced to back in North Carolina. Uh, there are a lot of big stalker rainbows uh, that inhabit a lot of those waters. And uh, it was one of those kind of flies that you put on, you see, and you're going to see it, and you're going to be like, get out of here. That thing's ridiculous. 
but it freaking works. It works when other flies don't work and it works when other eggs don't work. So in the category of junk food, this is like the double, tripper, quadruple, quarter pounder with cheese that those big boys just can't say no to. So uh, just, uh, I got a jig bomb, four mil in the front here, something nice and heavy, uh, get down. Uh, a lot of those big fish will be belly to the bottom. Uh, so we want something heavy. Uh, we're gonna go straight for the glow bug yarn. We're gonna grab a hank, and we're gonna trim it. We're gonna split our hank into two. Right, so you got two equal halves. One half ties right up along the bead. Wrap it in, fold it back. Right, the other hank comes on your side. Wrap it in, fold it back. Finish that off a little bit so that bead isn't gonna move, but we got that material jammed right in there. Grab your whip finish tool finish this nice little fly off here. Grab all your yarn here, trim it back just behind the bend of the hook. And you've got an egg that is the size of a trout's brain. Again, they crush it, this thing dances in the water. In some worlds, they call this a yarny. You could make it look a little bit better, but I'll tell you right now, this works just fine the way it does. Uh, trout, trout brain. Try it out. Trout brain. Try it out. I did. And uh, it still has a place in my box. I don't pull it out as often as I used to, uh, which is fine, right? Uh, but they, they, they still stash away down in there uh, and have a time and place uh, for, for experimentation. Um, Man, this is a really great question, dude. I don't know who this guy is, but I love this question. Wonder if you guys fish in any tube flies in summer when there's a tube hatch. And I've read it how it's written. But like, oh yeah, if there's a tube, tube hatch, you should just fish a tube fly. I wonder if you could just catch fish on a naked piece of plastic uh, with a hook out the back. If there's a red hook, I'd say yes. Black nickel hook, bronze hook. I'd probably still say yes. Eventually you get something to eat it. Uh, oh man. Yeah. Uh, Will, there, there's some comments on YouTube that I'm reading that are hilarious. Damn trophy, they'll pick a fly. Yeah, that thing's obnoxious large and obnoxiously, uh, obnoxiously large and obnoxiously effective. Um, but yeah, this, uh, it does look like a Y2K, except it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit bigger. Uh, I tied a modest size one. You could go a little bit bigger. And yeah, uh, you know, Mike here on, on YouTube asked if we've ever tried something like that on still waters. Uh, don't worry, Mike. We will get to a still water junk fly. We didn't want to dive into the world of still water junk flies because I feel like in that world, you can really lose yourself off the deep end of pure just like stuff you might refer to as just straight trash. Um, so we got one just to dabble because dabbling is important. And, you know, since we've got Mr. Charlie Craven in the house and, um, you know, I know, I know there's some folks out there that, that are, are Charlie fanboys. Uh, I have my, my Charlie shirt on underneath uh, my sweater here, uh, but I'll leave it on. Uh, we're going to tie up a Craven fly next. And he's got a fly that I don't know how to rate. Uh, you know, we've been rating some tens, that yarny that we just tied up the trout brain. I'd say maybe like a, a 6.4 on the dirt scale. It's not the worst I've ever seen, but it, it kind of shocked me uh, getting to, to see fish and hail that thing. Because you can see every fish move to it because that thing's like its own little light bulb underneath the water. You can't help but see it. So Charlie's fly, man, I don't know how to rate it. Let's watch it. And I think we'll get a better sense of how to rate his pig sticker. So stay with us.
Okay, we're going to tie one of my favorite little flies. This is a uh, totally dumb fly. Um, I'm not proud of it. It's not my pattern. Um, it's just a fly that I've come in contact with over the years that really does work. Um, this fly is called a pig sticker, and that's from the Latin term uh, for sticker of pigs, which means it catches big fish. And truthfully, um, I've probably caught more big giant fish on this fly than I have uh, nearly any other. Um, so it's worth, worth tying and having around. This is a uh, variation, um, you know, of aquatic worm, worm pattern where you'd normally fish a um, San Juan worm pattern. Um, I'll usually fish a pig sticker. One of the things I like about the pig sticker <clears throat> is that it uh, can be tied weighted. So I can fish it as a dry dropper rig um, where a conventional San Juan worm is just... Uh, not heavy enough to, to get down. So um, I'm going to start with a uh, Gamakatsu C12U. And this is a size six. Um, you can see it's a kale style. It's like the old Mustad 37160 um, kale style bend. And I'm going to take some 15 thousandths lead wire and, you know, again, like I keep mentioning, that's how the pros keep their lead wire. Try to keep it as loose as you can. You know, hopefully if there's some stuff coming off the end of the spool. Um, that's how people know you're not messing around. So I like to keep mine that way. A little pro tip there for you. I'm going to grab one end of this lead. And way down here around the bend is where I'm going to start it. And I'm going to wrap it all the way up over the hump. And I don't really worry too much about button those turns right close together because I've got a chance to squeeze them back back together here in a minute. Like so. So I weighed them pretty heavy. Um, and then I'll break those two ends off. Now, I've got a few friends that use heavier size lead wire and just make a few wraps in the center so you kind of have a, a lump there. Um, I like a little bit more gracefully tapered worm. Um, those same friends, Luke Beaver. Um, also, don't mind if the lead wire shows through the, the thread wraps, which um, I totally do mind. So um, we're going to try to avoid that. So you can see I've kind of pushed those lead wraps together as much as I can. And I'm going to start this thread. Maybe I'll tell you what it is. This is 140 denier UTC, and it's just red in this case. Um, red and orange are my two favorite colors. You can tie brown and pink ones too, but red and orange are my two favorites. Um, you don't want to use 70, it's just 70 denier. Uh, it'll take you all day to build it up. So I started that thread just behind the eye, and I'm not really worried about this tag end. I'll just kind of hold it down. But I'm going to build, start to build a thread dam from the hook shank up onto those lead wraps. And you can see how that tag will get caught as I go. Like so. Now, as I start to wrap, um, I tie left-handed. So as I wrap, um, I'm going to hold these lead wraps in place back here so I don't push them. Uh, but as I wrap the thread, my thread will flatten out. So I'm going to make my initial layer of thread here up over the lead. Not really overlapping, but I'm trying to get as much coverage as I can out of this all the way to the back, and then I'll jump down off the back end. And you can see how that thread is really spread out as I got back there. That's all part of the plan. Now I'm going to take a piece of small silver wire and again, see how, I, how that's all wound up there? That's how you know I'm not messing around. So I'm going to take a piece of this small lead wire, or a small silver wire, and I'm going to catch it just back here. You can see where I'm crossing it, just at the back end of the lead, and I'll pull it down to length. And then I'll pull it out because I know you wanted to see that again. Pull that down to length. And I'm going to wrap down around the bend a bit here. And then I'm going to create another thread down here at the back end. Don't worry about doing everything at once on these flies. you got to kind of work with the bare shanks as one piece and the, the leaded portion as another. So you can see how I'm just sort of tapering up onto the lead. Come well down around that bend. Now we should make a nice smooth transition up onto the lead. Now, as I'm coming forward here, I'm going to try to cover everything. I can unwind my thread and keep it laying nice and flat. 
as I turn that a bit here where I can see that a bit better, I want to just smooth that transition a bit. And right through the center, I'm going to smooth them off, take a couple layers of thread there. Just back and forth, nice and smooth, creating a nice smooth thread body covering all that red. Now, as I work up toward the front here, I want to keep this thread as flat as I can, but I want to make sure that I cover all the lead wraps underneath and sort of maintain that taper. As I get to this step, I want to kind of work up and down that thread dam. You can see I cover that last wrap of lead. And I'm going to come up just behind the eye. So you've got a nice, smooth thread body there. Now I'm going to take my silver wire. And I'm just going to evenly spiral this up the hook. right up to the eye, tie it off with a few turns. Just pop that out. Just a little thread head to cover that up. And then we'll finish up behind the eye. Trim that thread out. And really you could call it done there if you're, if you're a quitter, uh, but we're gonna put some sort of coating over the top. You can use Sally Hansen's or just regular head cement. Uh, with regular head cement, I like to go a couple of co couple of coats. Um, I'm going to use this Solar as Ultra Thin. I'm going to put a nice coat over the top. I want to get all the way around the hook. Nice and smooth. Like so, just to gloss things up there. I just want to make sure I don't have extra that's kind of sagging on the underside of the hook. And then I'll cook that up with my UV lamp. And there's our finished pig sticker. You know, just a red sand on worm on a size six hook. This seems like a, uh, a big fly. You know, it sounds, sounds big because it's a size six. It's really about half the size of conventional San Juan worm. So it's actually a kind of a small worm, um, which can be a little bit more stealthy. And you can certainly tie it in other sizes, but I'll be honest with you, I fish it in size six only. Um, red and orange, those are the two colors that I use most, um, both with the silver wire rib. And uh, man, that thing does catch fish. The, uh, it tumbles through the wire. You can kind of see the angle of the hook. Um, tumbles through the water. It looks like it's moving around, flipping around. And uh, it does catch some big fish. So uh, twist a few up, throw those in your box, try them next time you're out. Hope you enjoy it. Junk food doesn't only apply when we're talking about river fishing. There's plenty of junky stuff you can do in the lakes. And I think it even expands upon the idea of kind of a junk fly, right? And, um, you know, it's a, a junk fly is a fly that fish just want to jump on. And, and in the lakes, right, uh, color can be such an awesome, awesome opportunity to mix in a bunch of kind of non-traditional, quote unquote, junky colors. So we're going to do one today that's a, uh, a foam 
a double s blob, right? And uh, a blob is a super effective lake fly that's essentially an egg pattern. So I'd say this is about as, as junky as it gets. It starts by putting on uh, a foam cylinder and we're gonna attach that to the XC290 hook. This is a really, really perfect hook for this. It's, it's got the right length shank, but more importantly has uh, plenty of hook gap there and a beautiful limerick bend on here. One of my favorite still water hooks and works really well for this. So we're gonna start by just attaching that cylinder of foam in and we're gonna tie it down just at the very back of it here and wrap that down. Secure that foam in there. You can see that big piece of foam just ballooning out the back, right? Uh, and I'm about, you know, halfway, two thirds. And then we're gonna grab some fritz, right? And so this is orange fritz. Contrasting colors are great. You could do chartreuse, you could do a coral color, you could change up your color fritz. This is kind of like standby color fritz. And I'm just gonna strip a little bit of this off and expose the core for a nice tie down point. Let's get all that wrapped in. And we're gonna wrap this forward to the eye. And it doesn't have to be perfect because we're gonna palmer this thing up and so it's a cord, right? So I'm gonna pull back and wrap and pull back and wrap. And the nice thing about the tie down point where we started, and I'm gonna go right up against each other and I'm gonna to try to pack in as much of this. And the nice thing about where we started means we can pack in a lot of wraps uh, meaning we get a lot of volume to this. So when it strips through the water, right, it pushes a lot of water, gets some of the attention of some of those fish. I'm gonna lock it down here, bring it back. We got a bunch of stuff trapped in front and that's fine. I'm gonna grab it here, sweep it all back. And then whip finish this off here. this out, cut some of these strays out. And then another foam in the rear here, I'm gonna trim it just about the bend of the hook. All right, I don't wanna trim off too much because I lose some of that flotation. And what I like to do on these, the fun little thing, it's a junky thing to do, is I take my scissors and I come in here and I cut a little X, because X marks the spot on these guys. You want the fish to find it, and this thing is gonna be chugging through the water, and you're gonna stop it on a hard pause, and it's just gonna gently elevate, and those trout are gonna jump right on it. It's a super fun fly to fish. You can fish it a lot of different ways, but this is the fab, or the foam, rear end booby. Hey guys, this is Josh Grafham with Umqua Feather Merchants. Um, today, Umqua has asked me to tie an egg. So I'm gonna give you my most advanced egg pattern you've ever seen. Um, I'm gonna use a couple different materials, but it's not a, it's not a lot of materials. Um, this is, a, if I had to fish an egg, if I was forced to fish an egg, this would be the egg that I would fish. So we're gonna start off with a size 14 um, TMC 403 jig hook. I've slid a three millimeter gold bead on there, and we're gonna mess with some Glow Bright number eight uh, fluorescent thread. I'm gonna start by kind of putting a thread dam behind that bead. I just wanna make sure that that bead doesn't move anywhere. So I kind of work it down the shank of the hook for a second, and then I just add a couple, couple wraps right behind that bead to make sure that that bead stays in place. Once I have that done, I'm gonna cut my little tag. Then I'm gonna put a, a, a base of thread down the shank of the hook. Super advanced. So once I have that there, I'm going to put a dab of crazy glue on my thread. And then I'm gonna use this material called um, ecstasy yarn. I believe this is the, boy, I think this is the salmon color, fluorescent salmon. Um, I am gonna strip, this, this material has a core to it. I'm gonna strip this core back just a little bit. And I've created this little tag to tie in right there. Um, this material, um, light has a life of its own. You kind of want to use a fair bit of uh, water or spit. You can put a little 
cup of water next to you, but I'm gonna secure that tag in. And I'm actually gonna secure it in pretty far towards the, the bend of the hook. I'm not gonna center this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna attach it right at the back. I'm gonna come up the body there and leave my thread up at the front. This is where you need to use the water. Basically, you wet your fingers, you wet the material a little bit, and this material you can get to all go one direction. I'm gonna use a fair bit of water there, and I'm gonna straighten this material out. Once I have it straightened out, I'm gonna palmer this or wrap this material up the shank of the hook, nice and tight. Nothing crazy here. Sometimes because I moved it so far back that you have to go around the point of the hook and keep brushing the material back slightly. And I'm gonna create this big <coughs> fluffy ball of egg yarn. And then we're gonna cut it down and make it look pretty for an egg. So once I have it all the way palmered on there, and I think some people actually prefer to fish these big oblong thicker eggs. Um, I don't personally get to fish a lot of eggs or want to fish a lot of eggs, but when I do, this is the one. So once I have that palmered on there and straightened out, I'm gonna take this material and kind of split it up where I wanna run my thread through. I don't wanna create a big head on this thing. Once I have it split, I'm gonna use a little bit of tension and slide that globe right, right through there and tighten this down. One to two wraps through the material. I'm gonna cut it right at that core. Like I said, this material has a mind of its own. Then once that's done, I'm gonna secure the head of the fly right here. Couple wraps there, and then we're gonna whip finish. I like this low bright contrast on the fly just to give it a little bit of UV, if it matters at all. With that gold bead, two whip finishes, and that's done. So, like I said, some people like to keep the fly just like this. For me, um, it's not pretty enough, so I take a dubbing brush and I'm gonna pick this material out, get the fibers all kind of straight. You totally could tie this fly in half the time. You also can use all kinds of different egg materials and there are easier ways to tie an egg. But I like a jig egg and I like mine to look halfway pretty. So once I have it brushed all the way out, I'm gonna brush it back intentionally and once I have it brushed back, then I'm gonna start trimming. You can trim this in the vise or you can trim it in your hand. I'm gonna start in the vise. I'm gonna do just a little bit of trimming to get the front side. And for me, it's easier to trim in my hand once I get the first part started. So that's halfway trimmed. I'm gonna take it out of the vise. I'm gonna keep those fibers straight. And then I'm gonna kinda of try and trim that round shape right here. You can get real pretty with this. Um, you can use curved shank scissors will help a little bit. You can make this shape really nice. I'm gonna flip it over and do the sides. Like I said, I like to take a fair bit of this material off. I, I wrapped probably double what I needed on there intentionally to make it a little thicker. And now I'm just trimming it down. Really sharp scissors help a lot because then I can, it really cuts the, the little tiny fibers there. So I use some really nice Tiemco scissors, just cutting this little egg shape right here. I like this material better than some of the traditional egg yarns because the, the egg is not as firm and I can kind of cover up the hook here. And when they, when they eat that fly, it's softer in my opinion. Um, but there's a lot of, easier ways to do this, and you can make them quite a bit prettier using other materials. But I like this one, so. Once I have it trimmed, just about done there. You can kind of start to see the shape of the egg. I'll set it back in the vise. I like to keep mine a little bit bigger and I'll do a couple last minute clips on it. Pretty advanced for tying an egg, but like I said, there's lots of other materials and easier ways to do an egg. But if I'm gonna fish a jigged egg, 
and tie one. That's how I'm going to tie it. So that's a size 14 salmon colored egg beaded and the hook is hidden inside that egg. It's nice and soft, not quite perfectly round. Thanks a lot. You guys hear Santa's uh, jingle bells? Woo! Sorry for the, the cutout last time. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. I had unmuted because I know anyone who's watched Charlie, the, uh, the mute was an issue there. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's the beauty of, beauty of live entertainment. One of the other beauties of live entertainment is you can get little, little gifts like this. Oh man, the focus is awful. These are flaming hot condoms uh, that uh, was just delivered to my my DMs here. Uh, can't understand what those would do to a trout smell, let alone another human. Uh, couldn't tell if that was his hand or if that was just a photo we found on the internet. But either way, I love the enthusiasm. Uh, so the last two flies, we did the fab. There was a question that I saw on Instagram that popped up. Um, that was uh, asking if the foam in the back um, messes with hookups due to the tail. And I haven't had any issues uh, with that. A lot of times, uh, the biggest issue I have when fishing those kind of flies is not letting the fish actually eat the fly, right? You'll feel the beginnings of the bite as the fish is trying to get it in there. And you wanna, you know, uh, largely trout set it out of the fish's mouth versus letting him eat it, just keeping that rod tip low and doing a good strip set. So I haven't had any issues with that. Um, I don't know if anyone else has out there, uh, but uh, any kind of neutral buoyancy on lake flies, I find to be particularly dirty and exciting. Uh, they work uh, super, super well. And that's everything from like, you know, super imitative damsels um, to big egg patterns in the lakes. Uh, I like those a lot. And then let's see here. The next fly we tied was uh, was Josh, and uh, Josh is uh, Josh is our national sales manager at Umpqua, and um, uh, he we asked him to tie, you know, come out with something that was like a little outside of his comfort zone, and he did the ecstasy fly. And if you guys haven't tied with ecstasy, um, it's a really it has some unique properties outside of some of the other egg foam. Josh alluded to it. You can tie a prettier egg. You can tie a perfect circle egg. Umqua loads bins across the countries with like dead on perfect uh, circle eggs with both tungsten beads and without. Um, the, the difference between an egg like that and a material like ecstasy and, and Devin, you know, Devin showed the, the fly to us. I think he was one of the first guys who was, was bringing ecstasy in that, that, that I had, saw, had seen. And, um, uh, I like tying it with the bead inside the ecstasy, and it's a total personal preference there. Uh, it doesn't create as round of an egg as what Josh tied, but uh, the beauty of that is when you when you strip it, when you go to set the hook or pull an egg out of the water, you can feel that mass trying to release through the water, and you can feel the drag that that egg creates, and so your hook sets are all a bit, excuse me, a bit slower. <coughs> And so um, that ecstasy will, will kind of fold on itself and slick down, and, and those eggs come out really, really easy compared to their well-tied, perfectly formed counterparts. And that would be one of the reasons you'd want to pick up some ecstasy and try that out uh, is because it really does behave a lot differently in the water um, than, than a standard egg would. You know, I, we've got a, I'm sure there are people with some absolute of the, the dirtiest, uh, dirtiest egg rigs I've ever seen. Man, I feel like I fished Cheeseman two Saturdays ago uh, and just hiking along, you know, standard busy day down there, uh, hiking along and, and no judging. There was no judging happening, but I was observing. And there are some absolute dirt rigs out there. Uh, I watched a guy pegging an egg, not with a red hook. He would have been smart to, as we've seen tonight. Uh, but uh, it pegged an egg to a pegged leech to a midge. And I was like, man, that is like, 
that's about as dirty as a, of a rig ever. That's like a 15 on my scale of 10. Like we've gone up beyond to just a decimal and we're just like, boom, straight to the maximum. Uh, yeah. And uh, our, our buddy Daryl says, uh, uh, carp love ecstasy. That doesn't surprise me one bit. Carp love mops too from, uh, from, from a lot of experience. They love leeches. Uh, there's a lot to love. Uh, about a lot of these flies that we showed here, and they have a ton of crossover. You know, you can catch a whitefish on an egg. I don't know if you guys have ever done that. It's super cool. It's a native species. Uh, so let's celebrate the whitefish. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, case closed, Mr. Pat Dorsey. I'm in, I'm in recovery, knee surgery. Uh, you know, give me, give me some time. I'll be up nine miles up into the canyon uh, there and back. But, uh, but yeah, we saw, so... So we saw some really cool stuff tonight. Uh, I really thank you guys for tuning in and hanging out with us. Um, for those of you who aren't subscribed to our channels, please make sure to subscribe. Please share this with a friend that you want to show some, uh, some flies that they need to up their game with. Uh, if they can't catch them on the good looking stuff, give them the high protein snacks. And, um, and definitely join us again January 6th when we do tailwater. Uh, with Matt McCannell, and we're going to run through technical tailwater stuff because we're going to be in January. That's what we're going to have to fish. It's going to be cold. It's going to be fun, and the water will be largely empty compared to summertime crowds. So tailwater will be a blast. Subscribe. Again, thank you to Trout Unlimited for help spread the word on these super fun tying events. Um, without you guys joining us, we couldn't do what we do here this evening. So thank you guys so very much for being part of the Uncle community. Uh, and we hope this is the tie a few guys this winter season. Pop into your local dealers for any of those last minute uh, gifts that you need for the angler.